Rabbi Radinsky asked to make um, a brief remark, so thank you very much. First of all, I neglected last night to say I welcome all your smiling faces. <laughs> Happy to see all your smiling faces. Uh, and then I also like to acknowledge the fact that uh, that uh, many of you came over to me and wished me condolences on the passing of my brother. And last night I had a beer. And tonight I don't have a beer because the Shloshi, the 30 days of mourning for my brother over. So I have opted to take off the beer. And um, now the beer that I was wearing was as a sign of mourning. So now I have concluded that. So I just would like to tell you, you know, my brother was uh, a <coughs> very influential rabbi in Houston, Texas. He had 900 people at his funeral. <coughs> Including almost all the rabbis of Houston. He was, he was really a remarkable individual who influenced the Houston Jewish community in many, many ways. He also was a great humorist, and he liked to tell puns, usually that are both in Hebrew and in English. He would tell different kinds of puns. So uh, I'll just tell you four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have heard of him. You heard already, so you could groan silently. <laughs> but the, the first one I'll tell you is a uh, famous pun. He says, Why was Moshe Rabbeinu so successful in Egypt? Moses, why was he so successful in Egypt? And the answer is because he had a good staff. Okay, the next one he said, uh, what is the holiest organ in the human body? So this you have to know a little bit about Judaism. Ear hakodesh. <laughs> right? If you get ear hakodesh, which of course in Hebrew means the holy city, but in all the Hebrews it means that. Then he said, uh, when you transport a Sefer Torah, you should always put a seat belt around it. Why? Because that makes it a safer <laughs> And the last one, he said, uh, what is the proper beverage to drink on Purim? And the answer is, Vash tea. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, you know that the pun must run in the Radinsky family. It <laughs> doesn't stand alone. I want to just acknowledge one thing. Uh, Rabbi Radinsky is here at 7 o'clock. The Mignon is happening at the FBI. And I said, you know, it's really strange that you're here. So he said, there are two things. One is that the Shloshim is over. You know, he's having a clean shaver now. But the second thing really reflects really one of the values that's so important and what makes them so uh, special. He said, it's more important that I be here respecting my wife. It's more important to do that than to, to go to shul and down with the minyan. Uh, I, I, I do think that in many ways, that reflects the, the, the joy and the character of, of a wonderful, wonderful person. And, uh, but I'm introducing Barbara, and if anyone is worthy of that sort of respect, <laughs> I, I, I do think it's Barbara. Barbara I graduated Stern College, she was graduated from the Citadel. She, uh, she was the best rabbi's wife anyone could possibly imagine, not only raising a wonderful family here, uh, and now uh, having wonderful grandchildren, but also really offering uh, good counsel to many, many, many of you uh, and, uh, and us. So uh, it's a great, great pleasure to keep welcoming <coughs> Radinsky back. I hope we, uh, we continue to welcome that, the back for many, many more years. And it, it's an honor, it really is an honor to welcome Bob Rudinsky. It's all the equipment, we're working. Can you hear me? I go down. Right, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, 
We've had a really great time. I hope we haven't overstayed our welcome. And um, we've done a little bit of this and a little bit of that and seen a lot of people. And it's so nice to see all of you. Really so nice to see all of you. And I think I know almost everybody in the room. And for those, anybody that I don't know, it's a pleasure to meet you. And um, Charleston is changing. As I mentioned the other day, there are a lot of, lot of cranes around, and very big cranes that reach the sky. And uh, our kids wanted lots of pictures, so I haven't done such a great job of that. South Windermere, I think I mentioned that last time, has changed so much as we see those little buildings over there, and just lots of changes. And, um, but you know, y'all, you know, don't change. And, uh, <laughs> or, but we hopefully, any changes that do occur, and hopefully we all really do make changes, and that we know that whatever changes we all make, hopefully are all good changes. And um, I always tell people, no matter how old one is, we all need to continue to mature and to always reevaluate what life is about and, and figure out what works and what doesn't and how we can make our lives better. So again, thank you for having us. Mark, thank you for everything. Thank you for the SBI and to Dora Tikva and to all of you for welcoming, welcoming us so generously. Um, so I always say this, that when we know that we're coming here and November comes, it's time to think about what I'm going to speak about. And it's always a challenge, because I'm like, oh, what should I speak about? So last year was a little easier, and I used that speech a few times, you should all know. <laughs> and Mark, thanks for YouTubing it. People, I think, have viewed that one. That was pretty easy on caregivers, you know, about caregivers. That was, I think Janet Fox actually suggested, did you have an easy topic? What are you worried about? You can talk about your mother and about the caregiving process. Etc. Etc. So this year I thought, well, what what do I want to talk about? And I thought about the Book of Ruth. I think I was thinking about my daughters-in-law, and um, who were wonderful daughters-in-law, and um, my sons-in-law, who were great sons-in-law. But particularly because of Ruth and Naomi, I thought that would be a very nice topic. And I'm so proud of my daughters, who were also great daughters-in-law to their mothers-in-law. <laughs> and then, um, as my husband mentioned. Um, he just finished the 30 days mourning for his brother, and as I was preparing this little talk over the past few weeks, I was thinking it's really rather appropriate that I would be speaking tonight at the conclusion of the Shloshim, because we learn a lot of lessons in the Book of Ruth. We're going to just do the first chapter tonight because we're not going to be here for that long, and there's plenty to do just in the first chapter, and I've given our handouts. So, We'll talk about the things in a few moments, but the major things are really about how people should act with one another, and we'll go into more details in a few moments. So I would like my husband does know that I didn't know in advance that I was going to do this, but I want to dedicate this in Joey's memory, in memory of my brother, my brother Joseph Dzinski, who um, had a tremendous talent of approaching people, each person so kindly and so warmly and welcoming people no matter who they were, rich, poor, whatever color, whatever religion, whatever part of Judaism or any other religion they were. And I think that this would be an appropriate way for us to, um, besides the learning that we both did in his honor as we joined lots of other people who did a lot of learning in his memory, um, for me to dedicate this this evening to him. So what we're going to do is look at this first parak, the first chapter of the book of Ruth. Sarah Beth and I studied, Sarah Beth Rosen and I studied this, I don't know how many years ago. It was probably the first time, maybe 30 years ago, that I had done this as a grown-up with Sarah Beth, and we used to get together and, and go over the text. It's a very, very beautiful text. Everybody's familiar with it, I'm sure. And I thought that uh, we ought to look at it again and see how we can refresh our knowledge and what lessons we can learn from the Book of Ruth. There are so, so many ideas here, so many ideas that are very relevant to our lives. And it's amazing, um, it's amazing what we can learn from here. I have this very soft spot for the Book of Ruth and um, 
me because I was fortunate to have a, a good mother-in-law, a wonderful mother-in-law as well. It's amazing to think how this Moabite princess was willing to change her whole life and take on this whole new way of life. And that's one of the reasons that we read the book on Shavuos, because we learn about some of the laws of conversion and we learn about the devotion to Judaism that Ruth exhibited. So let's take a plunge and explore this together. Now, we're going to read first the first five psukim, the first five sentences, and um, let me read it. Okay. I know the print is a little small. I apologize for that. But. Okay. And it happened in the days when the judges judged. Do you need one, Marcy? It's a different text. But. Sure, I have one. It's the same book in Hebrew, but the English translations are different. That's why my husband and all the other rabbis always say, you have to know Hebrew because the English is always different. You get a different definition. Okay, so let's look at this. The first um, five sutram. And it happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land, and a man went from Bethlehem to Judah to sojourn in the fields of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were named Machlam and Philion, Ephratites of Bethlehem and Judah. They came to the field of Moab, and there they remained. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, not Oprah, but Orpah. They made a mistake somewhere, but not in this text. Um, Oprah, my parents must have made a mistake. And the other Ruth, and they had lived there by 10 years. The two of them, Machlom and Philion, also died. And the woman was bereft of her two <coughs> children and her husband. Okay, let's stop over here. What are some, just looking at this text, what are some things that you see from this text? What are some things that you learn from these few sentences? Don't be shy. It's not complicated. What are some things that you see? Okay, first, first of all, when did the story happen? In the days of the judges, okay, in the days of the Shoftim. Does anybody have any idea of who wrote this book? The Book of Ruth? It doesn't say this in the text, but does anybody know? Samuel the prophet wrote this book. Okay, what else do you see? From here, why did what was going on? What was um, not geographically? What was going on? What was a famine. a famine was going on? Okay, what else do we know? What else do you see in these sentences that you want to wonder about? What the text? Why the text is giving us this information? Pardon me. Okay, the husbands are dying, and who's the first one that dies? Okay, his name is Elimelech dies, and then the two sons die. I That's they tragic. Died in war. No, they didn't die in war. Not that I know of. I'm joking it out. Okay, well, okay. So we're going to talk about that. Okay, and where did they come from? It says where they came from. Bethlehem. Where is Bethlehem? Okay. Unfortunately, now it's very hard for us to go to Bethlehem. Sadly. It's not safe for us to go there very frequently. Bethlehem is in Judah, and where did they go? Moab. Moab. Okay. So, are there any questions that come to your mind when you look at these few first few sentences? What are you thinking? Why did they die? Okay. Why did they die? Very good question. Tragic. This poor woman lost her husband and her two sons. Terrible. Okay, what are some other questions that you might have? Why Moab? I'm sorry? Why Moab? Why, why do you ask that, Peter? Well, um, were there no other choices? Okay. Is there no point staying you know, in the land of Israel? Okay. And, and is there a problem with going to Moab? You can have a conflict. Well, what about, uh, isn't that the problem with uh, uh, Esau's? Do we have a little history with the Moabites? <laughs> Do we have a problem with Moab? 
Yeah, what's the problem? The attack was on the way to the Okay, so do we usually run to our enemies? Not usually, right? Okay, any other questions that you have? Or any comments that you see? Any problems that you see with the text? All right, so let's try to understand this. And you all brought up very, very good points. Um, you see, just in these few sukkim, you see death, you see widowhood, you see um, Naomi left alone, you see the bereavement. What, what did Elimelech do? Who is this man, Elimelech? Anybody have any idea? Elimelech is a rich man who comes from Israel and he leaves Israel and goes to Moab when there's a famine. Any thoughts about that? Let's say he's a, yes sir. Maybe there was a drought. Okay, a famine, a drought. So the people are left behind. All the other people have to stay in Beit Lechem. And this guy leaves. Elimelech, the landowner, who's a rich man, who's very, very comfortable, picks up and leaves his people behind. And he doesn't leave strangers behind. He leaves his clan, because we know that the people were, were in different places according to their tribes. So do you have a problem with that? Would you have a problem if you were in a dangerous situation and somebody who was very comfortable or who was a big macher just says, um, I see you guys. I'll take my gold and silver and I'll see you. It kind of reminds me a little bit. It's a very big stretch, but it reminds me of Hurricane Hugo. Okay, so Thursday morning, who was here for Hurricane Hugo? Okay. Thursday morning, we're deciding what we're going to do, what we're going to do, what we're going to do. My husband goes to show. We come back. Okay, what are we going to do? We'll go to the Saracens, like South Wind America. We can't stay at 74 Montague, obviously. Though I want you to know that the principal at uh, Mason Prep was very kind. And she had called us the day before, and she says, listen, We've built this builder, we've built a building. Remember they made a new building at Mason Prep. She said, you know, you poor Radinskis, you're living, you know, on that low ground, we're a little higher. She says, come over to the school. I want you to have the key to the school. So tomorrow when the hurricane comes, or whenever it's coming, you can be safe. Okay, so I go to the school, and she shows me around, she's so nice. It might have been Betty Disher, who I actually was in touch with recently. And um, she says, you know, just do whatever you need to do in this building. We want you to be safe. She says, but there are certain neighbors around the corner. Oh, please don't invite them. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, um, we didn't take, the, we didn't do that. But we did end up go. We were thinking that we were going to go to South Windermere. The Saracens wanted us to come to their house. And I had this vision of being in Boston when I was a very little girl and a hurricane coming. And I remember the big trees across the street. So I'm thinking, oh, why do we want to go to Saracens? What if the trees fall there? You know, we're not safe. My parents were living in South Wyoming. At any rate, we got in the car and we started to drive and drive and drive and went to Atlanta. We felt horrible because, I don't know if I felt so horrible, my husband felt horrible <laughs> because he felt that he was abandoning the show. He just felt like, you know, like, there are people here, there are fine birds we knew, the Resnicks didn't leave, we knew that there were people who didn't leave. So he had this horrible feeling, a really a bad feeling of, of leaving the congregation. And he said, no matter what, we are getting in the car Friday morning and we're going to get back before Shabbos and thank God, God let us back into the community. Remember the highways were closed and we were lucky we got back. So that was my, that was some of the feelings that I was feeling when I was relearning this story about, you know, really, what is it like? And I'm not putting, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to compare us in, in, in any way <coughs> to, um, to Ellie Mellaf, but <coughs> just trying to understand what it's like. So there, Ellie Mellaf is this rich guy with all these fields and all this stuff, and he leaves his people behind. And as we said, he goes to Moab. 
Moab is the enemy, so of all people, he's going to the enemy. That's not so good. And the Torah tells us that we're not supposed to have very much to do with, those, with that enemy. In fact, there was even a law that you're not supposed to marry those Moabites. And Elimelech dies, perhaps as a punishment. I, don't, I certainly can't speak for God, but you know, perhaps it's a punishment for what he did. But then his two sons die. Tragic, tragic. The worst thing that could happen to a parent, I think, is to lose a child. It's just, it's, it's so tragic. So um, she's then left alone. Ruth is left alone. And um, let's see what happens. Now, before we go on, though, I do want to say that not only did Eli Melach die and go to Moab, but they settled permanently there. One of the commentators says something very interesting. He says that, um, you know, they left and they didn't pray for the other people. They didn't daven for the people that we were left behind. And it's interesting, we do have a concept that when we daven, well, let me back up a little. If you think of the sitter and you think of how so many of the prayers are written, many of them, most of them, are written in the plural. Now, we say that if we daven for somebody else, we pray for somebody else, then hopefully God is going to take good care of us as well and answer our prayers and, and care for us. So some of the rabbis say that he was, he was just busy thinking of himself and not considering the other people, no davening for them, just not caring for anybody, just walks away, abandons his people, and leaves them to their suffering. Now, back to Moab, they didn't feed the Jewish people when they, were in, when they left Egypt, and now these um, young men have married these Moabite, Moabite ladies, and I'm not sure why somebody would want to get involved with people who have treated them badly, who have treated their ancestors badly, who are selfish people. One of the things that we see here is the idea of bichi rachav sheet, of freedom of choice. That's a very, very important Jewish concept. It's in the Torah, it's a very, very important concept. We have freedom of will. We make our decisions. I think we tend, you know, in therapy, I always say to people, oh, you made the best decision you could. You know, in therapy, I have to say that. <laughs> you made the best decision that you knew how to make at that moment. That's my therapy voice. <laughs> Sorry. You do. We all do make the best decisions that we know how to make. But the truth of the matter is decisions are very, very important. And we, sh we must not take our decisions lightly. So Elimelech made a decision and for his family. I'm sure he thought about it. The question becomes, what did Naomi have to say about that decision? We don't really know where she was with the decision. Did she complain? Did she say, we shouldn't go? Did she support him? I don't know. But at any rate, he made a decision which then the, the, um, the results of that decision keep playing themselves out. Um, so we have the sense of selfishness that we've seen, sense of ingratitude, sense of abandonment, lack of loyalty. Loyalty is a very big thing. We have to be loyal to each other. We need to have a sense of loyalty to our families and our communities. And it's just ironic that now Naomi is left alone or perhaps it's poetic justice that she's left alone. And is it a gift to Naomi? Or is it a punishment to Naomi that she survives? I don't have an answer. I think it's just food for thought. So let's continue our little, does somebody feel like reading? The next three Pesukim, volunteer, or do you want me to read? OK, I'll read. <laughs> Okay, she then arose along with her daughters, Pesach 6, sentence 6. She then arose along with her daughters-in-law to return from the fields of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that Hashem had remembered his people by giving them food. 
She left the place where she had been, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and they set out on the road to return to the land of Judah. <coughs> then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May Hashem deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with the dead and with me. May Hashem grant you that you may find security each in the home of her husband. She kissed them, and they raised their voice, and they wept. Okay, any thoughts, any, any comments that you have about these particular sentences? Any thoughts? She assumed that they would want to leave and not go with her. She assumed they would want to go back. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so what do you mean? Why? why so you're saying you, you think that she's assuming from so reading. She tells them to go back. Okay. Instead of saying you're a choice, then she just assumes that Okay. That they would want to go back. Okay. Anybody else? Maybe all. Yes, Sandra. It sounds like originally they wanted to be with her. Okay. They sat out on the road to do the all three of them. Okay. Why? Okay, so you think that she's thinking that they should be with her, with her own people because? Why do you think? Because she's a kind woman and she thinks they'd be better off. So okay. Okay. Could be. And that's a quite a selfless attitude. You know, that here she... Pardon me? So there's questions, I believe, as to whether they had converted, well, there is a question as to whether they had already converted and then later on when Ruth does go through the process, if it's a completion of the process or they had already done it, I think the rabbis have conversation about that. So is this not the time when Ruth talks to Abby to the only Well, there's go we're gonna to come to that in a few minutes. Okay, so she's come so she is on her way, she hears that that things are better now in um, the land of Israel. You know, I think that's a very interesting thing because now that it's better, she's going to leave? What does that say? You know, is it because it's better that she, is it because things are better that she's going to leave? Or just because she thinks it's right to go back to Israel that she's going to leave? I don't think the text is so clear about why she's going back to Israel. Um, it also could be not so selfless if she's if she's trying to go back to Israel because that's where she's going to get food and she's yeah. sending the daughters-in-law away from her. It, it, I mean, it could be that it's not so selfless if you look at it that way. That it's not so selfless. No, it's that she wants to go back and get her portion because she's the Jewish one and it says that she's going to take care of. His Maybe people. right, right. There are all those possibilities. Absolutely, all those possibilities. Um, and maybe now, maybe now she's ready to share the good fortune that the Jewish people are now being blessed with, whereas before she didn't want to be with the negative that they were experiencing. Or maybe now she's desperate. Maybe she's had enough of being in Moab, and she's ready to go back to her people. She wants to be back with them. Um, my guess is that she's depressed. My guess is that, I mean, how could she not be depressed? My guess is that her world has fallen apart. And now she could either be depressed, or maybe she was depressed. Maybe she's feeling better. Maybe she's got a sense of hope. Maybe she's feeling a new spark for life. And she's ready to take on this new life. Now, before we read further, what, what do you think is going on in her mind about going back to her people? What if, what would, yeah? Well, studies show that people often die within 25 miles of where they were born. Yeah. So that means that they have a tendency to try to return. Okay. Okay, so she wants to go back to her people. In turn, I mean, she wants to go back because that's, her place, right? Yes. What are some of the things you might you think that perhaps she's worried about? 
sit. Oh, um, she's worried about uh, traveling alone, and that's why she okay. took two with her. Okay. So Wouldn't you have discussed it ahead of time that they were just going to take her there and go back? Okay, right. And remember, I mean, it's a journey. You know, she doesn't have her Lexus to get into. She doesn't have her bus to get into. So I don't know how far is Moa from Beit Lachem. They have to come all the way. It's 30 miles. Okay, 30 miles, that's a fur piece to walk. Okay, we have the acceptance of the Moabite woman to back to her own. To okay, her. all right, that's very important. So she could be worried, to read the point my finger, she could be worried about the people accepting her daughters in law. What else might she be very worried about? And accepting her back. Why? Because she abandoned them. Right, right, okay, so right. Okay, let's think of ourselves the real selves of us. You know, how forgiving are we really? Okay, we, we should be forgiving. The, the um, hardest words to say are, I'm sorry. I just bought a great children's book, by the way, by that title, a Yom Kippur book, I'm sorry. So here is this woman now, who is going to have to face all the yentas, all those people, <laughs> that she left behind. That is very, very <coughs> difficult. How can she stand up straight and tall and go back to the place that she had left behind? That's a very, very, very difficult thing. And then how are the people going to accept her? What was the reason she left the people? Yes, yeah, right, but she left them all behind in their desperation. Okay, so let's then look at these sutta. Let's, <laughs> let's look at these sutta. And what do you think about um, the daughters-in-law? How hard might it have been, or how easy might it have been for them to leave? What do you think? <coughs> yeah? At that stage, you like easier. For the girls to leave? Yes. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Anybody think it might have been hard for them to leave? Anybody think, yes, Andrew? Like, they were going to people, they, they were leaving their people to be with people they've never been with. They yeah, okay, so therefore, therefore. Therefore, I think they were, I think they were making the decision because they loved their own. Uh-huh, okay. They also didn't find their own men to marry. They married this. Okay. 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 Maybe they're better men. Okay. Okay, so then let's move forward. And let's see what happens over here. Um, where are we? We went through plus at nine, right? Mm -hmm. Six through nine. Okay. We're at ten. Yeah, we're at ten. Right. Okay. Um, I think it's also a very amazing thing, I might add on a personal note, when she says, may Hashem grant you that you might find security in the home of her husband. As a child, I remember very, very vividly, my mother had lost a young brother when he was 29 years old. So it was, um, it was uh, I don't know, about 15 years before I was born. So I grew up with this idea of knowing that I had an uncle who had died very young and had left a one-year-old child. And I also grew up knowing that my bubby, my grandmother, the mother of my, of my uncle, my mother's mother, was always very protective of that daughter-in-law. Now sometimes you hear bad stories, negative stories when these tragedies happen. I happen to have grown up with this knowing that my bubby always looked out for her. And at some point she said to her, Sarala, you need to go get married again. And I didn't even know, I didn't understand why her uncle, we referred to, by, by her husband was referred to as Uncle Sam by the last name, but he was my uncle. When she remarried, he was my uncle. So I just knew that that's what, like, that's what people do, you know, and bad things happen, you kind of pull it together. So here, but it's not typical, we should know that. Um, so here, she says, um, you know, go, go find a new life for, for yourself. She kisses them, they raise their voice, and they whip. And I pictured that scene, you know, standing on the curb there, and oi, they, okay. So, and they said to her, look at Sukkim 10 to 14, and they said to her, nope, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters, 
Why should you come with me? Have I any more sons in my womb who could become husbands to you? Turn back, my daughters. Go along, for I'm too old to have a husband, even if I were to say there's hope for me, and even if I were to have a husband tonight, and even bear sons. Would you wait for them until they were grown up? Would you tie yourselves down for them and not marry anyone else? No, my daughters, I'm very embittered on account of you, for the hand of Hashem has gone forth against me. So here, Naomi is telling these young ladies to go on their way. Create a new life for yourselves is what she's saying to them. Go find some new men to marry. Go go and, and see what what you can create. And I just have this vision, you know, if you close your eyes for a minute and you see these three women standing there weeping and after all they spent these years together so they know each other very well. They know the ins and the outs and the crisis of trying to decide to go, not to go, to go. What do I do? Do I leave my mother-in-law? Do I not leave my mother-in-law? Do I want you to go with the daughters-in-law? So I think there's a lot of um, drama, and I don't mean drama in the negative kind of way. There's emotional trauma, emotional drama, trying to make very, very major decisions. And then what happens? Class of 14. They raised up their voice and they wept again. So the crying, the sadness. They become a family. They become a family. These three now are a unit, and they have to separate from each other, perhaps. Orpa kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpa leaves, and Ruth clung to her. That word clung, to cling, is a very strong Hebrew word. For those of you who know Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew, it says, Vatisenakolan, they raise their voices, Vatipkena, and they crowd out some more, Vatishak Orpa, Lachamata, Orpa kissed her mother-in-law, Baruch, Ruth Dafkaba. It's the same word that we use in Breshit when we talk about marriage, that a husband or wife is supposed to cling to each other cling to each other, they're sticking together, they're a team. So Ruth now is going to stick together with her mother-in-law. Now it's very interesting, because we talked about the at the very beginning when we talk about freedom of choice. The freedom of choice now that they made, and that it's a free choice, nothing's hanging over Ruth's head, over Ruth's head. nothing's hanging over Naomi's head to make these decisions. Interestingly enough, does anybody know who was the descendant of Arpa? Goliath. Who said it? Somebody? Yes? Goliath. Goliath is the descendant, I think the child of Arpa. And David, King David, is the grandson of Ruth. Now how is that when you think about the Chirach of Sheep and the choices that we made, what that we made? So Arpa goes back to her people. She has this guy, Goliath. Ruth takes on Naomi and the Jewish people. And she becomes, this Moabite princess, becomes the grandmother of King David. A little irony in there. And I find that very to be very, very interesting. And when later on, by the way, the word dabak, stick, cling to, later on in the book, it's used again when Boaz, who we're really not going to talk about tonight, we'll have to come back to that another time next year, um, <laughs> when he used the same, pardon me? Wasn't he very rich? Boaz? Boaz, yeah, he was a landowner, yes. And he, yes, yes, yes. And he later tells her, he uses the same word, dabak, stick to the reapers in my field. Later on, when she's going out and they're destitute for food, that same word, stick to. It has a real seriousness of strength. All right, let's look at Sukkim 15, because of 15. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has returned to her people and to her God, little g, O D. Go follow your sister-in-law. She's not only saying, Ruth, just go. Go, go, go be with your sister-in-law, it's good for you. But Ruth said, nope. 
Don't urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. Now, the, the next few lines are, everybody knows those lines, and there are even some popular songs that I remember that, um, with these words. Yeah, whether that goes. And it's very, very, very powerful. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go, Lafayette. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people are my people, and, my go and your God is my God. So what is she saying over here? What is Ruth saying? This certainly is the culmination of what? She wants to be Jewish, so even if perhaps they've already begun the process years ago. So this is now the culmination of her conversion to Judaism. She is taking on the Jewish people lock, stock, and barrel. Wherever you go, I will be going with you. Whatever you do, wherever you sleep, wherever you sleep, and there's a lot of um, depth to wherever you sleep because you can't just go sleep anywhere. A proper Jewish lady is going to be proper about where she chooses to sleep and who's around and, and what environment she's on. Your people are my people. Taking on the Jewish people is not so easy. It already wasn't so easy in her days. And um, your God is my God. Your Hashem is my Hashem. Where you die, I will die. Perhaps that means that where you die, then I can be buried in your, in your area as well. And she says, and there I will be buried. Thus may Hashem do to me and more if anything but death separates from us. This is a very, very powerful, powerful um, paragraph. They're very, very touching, strong statements in my opinion, that Ruth is making to Naomi. And is Ruth going beyond the call of duty? She didn't have to go. She could have gone back to her people. Why does she choose to go? Is she excessively kind? Is she one of these people that has no boundaries? Is she doing it just to be nice? To me, it seems as if she's doing it not just to be nice. To me, it seems from the text and what she's taking on that she's very serious about it. She's very determined. It doesn't seem to be any coercion here. Perhaps she, just from observing Ruth, perhaps she falls in love with the Jewish people. Perhaps by observing Ruth, she wants, excuse me, by Ruth observing Naomi, I'm sorry. She wants to be part of the Jewish people. Perhaps Ruth has boundless compassion. Perhaps she has boundless kindness. Perhaps she had a tremendous sensitivity to other people. All positive things that we can learn about how to treat other people, being kind, being sensitive, being extra sensitive to people. And of course, this is a statement of loyalty to the Knesset Israel. When somebody comes into the people of Israel, when somebody converts into the Jewish people, you're not just coming into the family, you're coming into the whole community. You know, you come to Charleston, if you're born into the community or you choose to be part of the community, the community takes you on, good, bad, otherwise, but you become part of the community. So becoming Part of the Jewish people is very, very big. We have this concept of Knesset Yisrael. It's the big community, not just us sitting in here, but the big Jewish community all over the world. Uh, well, in a few minutes, okay. So Naomi saw that Ruth was very steadfast in her conviction. Naomi has this um, big speech and devotion, and it repeats itself through the narrative with a kindness being constantly brought up. What is the name, what by the way does Naomi mean? Anybody have a kid or anybody in the room named Naomi? Pleasant. Pleasant, what? thank you, Uri. And Naomi means pleasant. It's interesting that Naomi's name is Naomi, pleasant. You know, we sometimes say Kishma or Kishmo Kahu or Kishma Kahi. I told that to Janice. When I remembered the other day I had this thought about um, 
I was remembering Janice's Hebrew name, which is, I remembered it was Chana, and I remember that at Aisha Chayel, I used to teach, uh, for those of you who don't know, I taught the Aisha Chayel class. Girls who were 12, 13 years old who used to come to our house every Wednesday night, and our kids would sit on the floor in the other room because they weren't supposed to be part of the class when they were little kids, and they would listen to what was going on, and uh, anyway, that was a fun time. But I was telling Janice, I said, Janice, I remember what I said at your Aisha Chayel class, because I said the same thing, Kishmar Kafi, as your name, so are you. Janice has a lot of fame. Some people fit their names. You know, their name happens to be what their personalities are. So like Naomi, Naomi was a very, not, no, I'm very uh, pleasant, very, very pleasant. Perhaps that was part of the attraction that Ruth had to Naomi, that she was very, very pleasant. Okay, and we talked about Orpah being the, um, the uh, ancestor of Goliath. So again, remember this idea of decision making and consequences. When we make decisions, they affect our children, they affect our next generation, and next generation, and next generation. And it's amazing because it's very hard to think so many generations. And now I look back and I say, oh my gosh, you know, our oldest daughter just turned 50. So we made a decision to come to Charleston, South Carolina. We think that we made the right decision, but you know, you have everybody has all these roads and opportunities in front of you, and you know, you can take this path, you can take this path, and you can take this path. And when you're young, it's a little hard to say, oh, what's going to happen? Nobody can foresee what's going to happen. And young parents have to make decisions about schools. They have to make decisions about Letting their kids hang around with kids or not, you know, other kids. They have to make a decision, you know, do I go to Sholancha this morning? Do I not go to Sholancha this morning? Maybe I don't really care about it. I'm not observant. Should I go to Sholancha this morning? Should I keep the kids out of school on Pesach? Should I keep the kids out of school on Shavuot? What kind of school should I send them to? They're decisions that I think young parents don't, you don't realize what are the consequences of those decisions? And none of us has it perfectly right. But whatever the decision is, should I go on that vacation? We recently had to make a decision. We were supposed to go to Israel. Okay, going to Israel is a great thing. We, will, we haven't been for almost five years. Well, unfortunately, my brother-in-law got very sick. And we were like, I mean, we took out insurance. Not that that would matter or not. And the decision was, do we go to Israel? Do we not go to Israel? That was basically an easy decision because we knew that we ought not go to Israel, we should go visit him. But in life, there are so many decisions to make and so many consequences and so many lessons. You know, what was the lesson that hopefully our grandchildren saw something by the decision that we made a few weeks ago not to go to Israel? We didn't do it to teach them a lesson. But what impact will that decision that we made pretty easily have on them one day when they have to make decisions. So again, we have all kinds of decisions, we have all kinds of challenges. Orpa made that decision and she ended up with a very strong descendant. Ruth made the decision and she, her decision, she made, this, Ruth made her decision and she ended up with very spiritually strong descendants. So, the story goes on. Let's look at sentence 19. Um, did I post? Oh, wait a minute. I'm, oh, yeah, okay. I didn't know if I cut and pasted right. Okay, and the two of them went. Ooh, does it count that he took a few minutes for me, Marty? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> Does it count that my husband took a few minutes? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Let's look at 19. And then the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. Now I'm reminded over here when you see and the um, the two of them walking. I could just, and I'm thinking of Abraham and Yitzchak as they're walking and the other 
parts, the biblical parts, uh, when you see two people walking together, what does that mean when two people are walking arm in arm and side by side with each other? How they're so in tune with each other. But this is very dramatic. What happens? By he kavona, I'll read it in English. And when they come, and it came to pass when they arrived in Bethlehem, the entire city was tumultuous over them. And the women said, could this be Naomi? Okay, so what's going on here? How are the people greeting them? What are the people in the city thinking when Naomi returns? Yeah, yeah right, yeah. So she's back, that lady, like, what do we need her for? What's she doing here now? So, pardon me? Somebody say something? Okay, so, um, I think it's very, it, I just can't even imagine what it has to be like for Naomi when she has the guts, when she has that courage to go back to Beit Lechem. <coughs> What's it like when, even if you've been the one to hurt somebody, so let's say, let's say you're the one who's hurt somebody and then you have to walk into that crowd. And no matter how wonderful people are, they're not necessarily so forgiving as we said before. And it's just hard. It's hard to walk into, into that group. There are all these people left behind. And the Hebrew word is very, the Hebrew word says it, I think, much better than it says it in English. Because it says, um, so the English translation says, the entire city was tumultuous. I think it's much more than tumultuous. You know, you can imagine this group is talking and that group is talking and this one is dramatic and that one is dramatic. What are they doing with each other? What are they all saying about this poor lady? So she walks back, she goes into the, she goes back to her old people and she says to them, don't call me Naomi, which we said means what? Peasant, okay? She replies, call me Mara. Now call me an embittered person, for the Almighty has dealt very, very bitterly with me. She's had a very, very tragic, sad life. And we're hoping now that people will have empathy for her. We're hoping that people will be sensitive to her needs, just like we all need to be sensitive to people's needs. Nobody knows what's going on in somebody else's heart. Nobody knows what's, gone in, what's happened to somebody this morning. Maybe that person at the cash register, the cash register is very grumpy when we go through the cash register. When we go to, when we see that cashier. But who knows what kind of horrible day that person's had. Nobody knows what anybody else is experiencing. So she says, I was full when I went away, but Hashem has brought me back empty. How can you call me not only? Hashem has testified against me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And so it was that Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, returned from the fields of Moab. They came to Beit Lechem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So they came as far as Beit Lechem. The people there are astir. The, women, the people there are abuzz as they're welcoming her. I think that um, we're not going to continue with the story. Just briefly, I think it probably everybody knows that there are three more, three more short chapters in the book that I encourage you to read on your own. And then later on, Naomi encourages Ruth to go into the fields, and she encourages her out to go see Boa. Boaz, who's a distant relative, and um, offers respite and protection to Naomi. Um, eventually, Boaz marries, excuse me, to Ruth. And eventually, Boaz and Ruth marry, and Ruth becomes the grandmother of the south of King David. So the theme of kindness just continues throughout the book. And you see this whole idea so far that we've talked about is interaction between people. You can see over here contrast. You see the rich Ali Melach, and then there's desperation. You see they're married at first, and then you see widowhood. You see children alive and well, and then the horrible tragedy of death. You see alienation, and then you see a renewed sense of belonging. You see how there's disdain, at the same time welcoming. 
You see tragedy and you see resolution. You see this whole idea of kavod habriot. And kavod habriot, I guess the best way to explain kavod habriot is how do we treat one another? And that's really what life is about. How do we treat one another? And that's where, when I said that I wanted to do this in memory of my brother-in-law, this whole idea of how, how are we nice to one another? You know what, we all think we're so nice. We're all so, oh great, I'm so nice. But the truth of the matter is, are we really so nice? And what does nice mean? I think we got to eliminate the word nice from our vocabulary. Because it says absolutely nothing. OK, how, how do you do nice? That would be my favorite question. So we have actually, in Jewish law, we have in Terkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, how do we treat people? How do we treat one another? So there's a sentence, who is an honored person? The rabbis say, the honored person is the person who knows how to honor other people. We also have another statement that says, your honor, your, let the honor of your friend be even greater than your, your honor. That's a hard one, my friends. Most of us have egos, and most of us want a lot of honor. It's very, very challenging to say, you know what? Let that other person get the honor first. You go before me. You get the honor. I'll move back. I don't have to be on the stage right now. People have a lot of challenges with that, and I think that it's something for us to all to think about, about seriously, how do we really treat other people? Not how do we treat our best friends, but how do we treat other people who are not our best friends? The Ahab Tolerea we all know about that. Treat your people the way you want to be treated. So another concept that, another something that I think we should think about is um, the idea of Naomi and Ruth and their relationship. Is there anybody in the Torah that you can think of where there was an in-law relationship that was a very nice relationship. Anyone? Okay, go back to Moshe, who was his father-in-law. Okay, Yitro. So Moshe and Yitro actually had a very nice relationship. They knew how to respect each other, and Yitro gave Moshe advice. Moshe listened to his advice. That's something that we can all learn. Also says in when it talks in the Ten Commandments about treating parents. So Rashi explains on the uh, sentence in the Torah, honor your father and mother, exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to make sure that your parents are fed. That's what real honor and respect are. Make sure that your parents are fed. Make sure they're clothed properly. Make sure they have a proper place to um, to eat, to, to live, and that they're cared for. So we have to be, I think we need to be, to learn to be much more specific when we talk about people's behavior and how you um, demonstrate that you care for people. So over here, I would say that it's not enough just to say I'm nice, as I said, but intertw intertwined into this beautiful story we have the ideas of loyalty, loyalty to family, didn't happen, then loyalty does happen, loyalty to family and strangers, making decisions that have long-term effects. We have this idea about the power of hope. There's a wonderful book, by the way, that um, Rabbi Maurice Lamb wrote. I think it's actually called The Power of Hope, and I would encourage people to read that book, especially if somebody is having a little hard time the idea of the power of hope. It's always good to be able to hold on to something and to know that Hashem is with us and that things can get better. The idea of, of the idea that we have in the book of things changing, the song Patikva, the National Jewish Anthem, we always carry hope with us. We're very fortunate that we can carry hope. Nobody should ever, ever give up, no matter how bad things are. We have in this book the idea of steadfastness, and good ideals and principles. And we have the idea of reuniting the people that we might have harmed, the people that might have harmed us. That's a hard one. But we really all can reunite. Everybody can try to make peace with people that might have hurt them or harmed them, or people that you might have harmed or hurt. 
Later on, we have the idea of modesty. So, in conclusion, I'm going to share something about a book I recently read. Has anybody read the book, um, How Starbucks Saved My Life? Anybody? So I know some of you probably have Starbucks saving your life every morning. Um, I know a lot of people who can't come through the day without Starbucks. It's a book. I'm a slow reader, but this was even a quick read for me. How Starbucks Saved My Life. It's a very interesting book. It's written, I don't know if I know the author, but you won't. You, you'll, you'll be able to find the book easily. The guy who writes the book is a man maybe in his 50s. He's a guy who's had it all. He's been a big executive. He's been very, very comfortable, has a family, had everything that he needed, except <coughs> that um, he lost it all by the time he was 60. He just made some very, very poor decisions. And he ended up losing his family. He ended up losing his money. And he's desperate. But he acts like he's not desperate. So he puts on a suit every day, goes to a Starbucks, sits there with a computer. We went to Starbucks today. Everybody was there with a little laptop. You know how it is in Starbucks. I saw it here in Marty's place. That's how they sit, too. So that's probably the next Starbucks. <laughs> OK, so he goes to this place. And uh, he's trying to get business. But business doesn't come his way. And he's really never. He has no money. So this little woman is sitting next to him, and she says, um, how would you like to work at Starbucks? I'm like, what? Work at Starbucks? Me? And he's thinking to himself, me? This big executive who work at Starbucks? And what's it called? A barista? Is that how you pronounce it? Barista? Barista. 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 <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. I read the other day that it's not so bad if you don't know how to pronounce the word. It means you've read it and not heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this little girl says to him, do you want to work at Starbucks? Me, work at Starbucks? You want to serve coffee and all that? Anyway, he's desperate. So he takes this job as a barista at Starbucks in New York. And all of a sudden, this big, big, fancy schmancy executive has to learn how to behave. Because the policy in the store is that everybody sweeps the floor. And everybody washes the floor. And everybody has to do all the jobs. And you don't just throw the food at somebody, but you interact with your customers, and you treat them properly. And this man goes through this job, and then he writes about it. And he talks about that's how it saved his life, because he learned how to interact with people. He had a very tough lesson, and I don't wish that kind of a lesson on any of us. But it's amazing how in Starbucks, by doing menial things, and taking on a job, and how much could he earn? $10 an hour, and whatever he earned. He went from feeling so much better about himself and learning so much more about himself and learning how to care for people. So on that note, we have the Book of Ruth. There are so many lessons for us that we can learn from that. And my hope and prayer is that we will all continue to improve our own relationships within our families, within our friendships, within our community, the small community, within the bigger community. And that God only should help us find big peace in the whole world, and that uh, and that the people who leave this world will make good decisions, and that we will all make good decisions. And I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.